Welcome back now to Sentimental Journey. About a week ago, Australia lost one of its most famous sons, the composer Jack O'Hagan. He died in Melbourne at the very good age of 88. Jack's most famous composition, of course, is The Road to Gundagai. It put that New South Wales town right on the map, the town as well as the dog on the tucker box. About three years ago, I went to see Jack O'Hagan in his nursing home in Melbourne and made a long interview, uh, which we illustrated with records. It's been played a couple of times on the air already. Alison and I thought it would be a fitting tribute to Jack O'Hagan to replay tonight that special program. Jack, I was just totting up. You know, uh, you have lived under the reign of six English monarchs since you were born there in Fitzroy on November the 29th, 1898. Yeah. Uh, well, actually, I've got a rough chance of living into three centuries, <laughs> but I wouldn't be <laughs> better on it. <laughs> What's your first childhood memory? <clears throat> I always messed around with piano, and although I learned music, my mother had me taught music for a long time, but I uh, used to drive the uh, damned uh, music uh, master that was teaching me mad because I played what I had to play, learned during the week, you know, while he came next week. But I played it in a different key. And he, <laughs> said, he said, you're not playing this in the right key. He said, I said, oh, I'm sorry, I thought it was, but uh, that's the way I, I played by ear practically from the start. Mm. And I'm in damn good company there with Coward and Berlin and mm. a couple of other stories. <laughs> <laughs> Uh, Your father um, is often said to have been a publican, but that wasn't his major interest in life, was it? Well, no, he was, as I say, he was a pretty brilliant bloke. He was ducks of his school. Uh, and in fact, the O'Hagan four brothers were all pretty smart boys, and three of them were ducks of what they called Old Paradians College there. That's <coughs> where, um, wouldn't matter to you, but uh, it's up where uh, the Masonic uh, gather you. Dallas Brooks Hall and all that, oh, yes, yes. and uh, they were um, all pretty brilliant, they were ducks of the college and uh, they took various degrees, two of them became chemists, including my father, and the second uh, was a um, barrister with um, Blake and Riggle, which was one of the biggest shows we have in Victoria, or it was then, I don't know now. How did a chemist become a publican? I think the fact that uh, making quick money quicker hmm. than chemists in those days. <laughs> <laughs> I think in any days, isn't it? <laughs> <laughs> and, uh, but uh, he never made a lot of money out of from what I can gather. He never had much chance, Jack, because he died when you were very young, didn't he? Yes, yeah, sure. But I have a memory of him, uh, particularly once in taking me down to the famous old Coles book arcade, and seeing Cole's the, little, funny book. the little fellas here and the little blokes winding <laughs> turn out at the, as you made the entrance. Mm. But uh, that was an extraordinary turnout. And my family knew the Coles family very well. And I used to go there and stay there frequently. And uh, there were three Coles girls and two brothers. And uh, the brothers ran the show of the old man, who was quite a personality. And uh, it was a huge show, you know, it ran from Burke Street right through to Collins Street, uh, over a little Collins Street and right through there. And uh, books only, I expect there'd be a few places in the world that would be any larger than that at that time. And I used to love being there, particularly uh, as a child, a memory, when the famous eight hours procession came along, eight hours work, eight hours play, eight hours rest, that was the idea then. And they had their big procession along Burke Street. That was a highlight in my life to watch that from the windows of uh, Cole's Book Arcade right down on it. Harking back to your father, uh, I said he was, uh, you were young when he died, but he was only a very young man. He was only about yes. 25, wasn't he? Yes, that's right, sure. That well, must I'm have never married again. No, that must have made things pretty tough for for your mother bringing up a family. Yes. Were there more? There were more than you. No, I was the only child, mm. probably a spoiled brat, and uh, the uh, no mother had a, a pretty solid job then, and uh, she wasn't a very good businesswoman, and uh, 
We, well, whether, whether she should have made a lot of money, she didn't. Mm. And later we moved from our so I was brought up in a, what I call a rough environment. Uh, not that it worried me very much, but uh, Fitzroy, and then later on she bought another hotel in West Melbourne. And uh, the two of our neighbours, about 40 doors down, were Arthur Colwell and his brother. And Arthur used to walk with his head in the clouds, they're all <laughs> passing us, never recognised me at all. But don't forget, I was a few years younger. <laughs> but uh, he was a, quite an interesting black. You had to leave school fairly early and help out, you know, with the family. Well, you were about 15 before when you left school. Yeah, yeah 15 or 16. I, I was at St. Patrick's College for seven or eight years under the Jesuits. And then I boarded at uh, Xavier for a period of about uh, maybe 12 months, no longer. Mm. That would be about 19, 12, 13. Yes. Then uh, <clears throat> after that, uh, I came back to St. Patrick's College and uh, I loved cricket. I was a good sport, by the way. I played a hell of a good game of cricket and bowled a very good googly. <laughs> <laughs> batsman as well? <laughs> mm -hmm. A batsman as well? Well, well, I could stay there, but that was about <laughs> all. You wouldn't call me a stylish batsman. <laughs> um, so th then, after you left, uh, after you left school, uh, mm -hmm. was that when you started to get into the real estate business? Was that your first job? Yes, yeah, sure. I got into the real estate business because I had to have a job. But I had a couple of things that I expect they sound almost childish now, but I had to be home every Friday night and Saturday night to play piano for the local who thought they had very good voices. Some of them did have good voices, but not all of them. And songs like Thora, Thora, speak to me, Thora, would you know that one? Yes, I do. Famous old ballad, yes. <laughs> and uh, um, so Ernest Ball was the one of the big uh, songwriters of that time. Love Me in the World is Mine. Uh -huh. Jerusalem, I think, was one of his too. Anyhow, uh, it was an interesting dinner, but I had to play for them every Saturday night and Friday night. Mother said it was good for business, mm. and so Jack had to play. And I thoroughly enjoyed it there. No um, radio then, of course, to entertain, so it was songs around the piano. That, that, that was the big, the old musical evening was a wonderful thing. I mean, I'm not talking that type of musical evening, but the type where you went out to a lot of friends' place and you had a copy of something in your pocket that you'd rehearsed for a couple of weeks and you were going to floor them when you sang it and somebody sang it before you. <laughs> <laughs> what about your first song, Jack? Do you remember what it was when you wrote it? Mm -hmm. Your first song when you yes. wrote it? The first song I wrote was with Henry Penn. We were on the... Henry came out with a crowd called the Brussels Concert Party and he was a magnificent pianist, you know, Penn, and most versatile. And uh, he, uh, he, he, he was called Henri Penn because yeah. he was with the Brussels Concert Party and they're all the Belgians. And uh, so uh, Henry was the pianist, but all was known to the public as Henri Penn. I remember him, of course. I put him on the air dozens of times while yeah, he was broadcasting for the ABC. How did you meet him, though? We were on the beach. We were staying at a hotel called the Red Bluff in Sandringham. You'd probably know, would you? <laughs> Anyhow, we were on the beach and uh, I said, you know, I, I'm keen to write a song. And uh, he said, well, he said, I could be uh, um, whatever you want. He said, I, I'd uh, play anything you want and you can write the lyric. So we wrote two songs, uh, and that Honolulu melody and, uh, no, Oh, Those Honolulu Girls and that mysterious melody. Uh, he wrote the words and he wrote the music. That's it. Mm. Uh, Henry went into Allen's, uh, probably if I'd have gone in, I would have, it wouldn't have taken the slightest damn notice of me, but Henry was quite a bit of a name, and he went in and they were both accepted in publication. And uh, I know we got 14 pounds each out of the royalties, so they didn't smash the business, but it was, it was a start. You must have felt that, uh, oh, Prosperity was really around the corner when you had a, two songs published. Oh, my, I did, frankly, yes. I uh, probably got a bit of a swelled head. <laughs> and uh, so from then on, was uh, one day I was walking through Allen's and George Sutherland, the managing director of Allen's, said to me, I've been looking for you. 
He said, would you like to join our organisation? And I said, I would, Mr Sutherland. I was flabbergasted. I was getting £3.10 in an estate agent's age, office. And uh, he said, I'll give you I'll give you three months trial at £8 a week. Well, my God, Father, that was money in those days. <laughs> you could do a lot of with £8 in it. So anyhow, I stayed there and I was with Alan then pretty well for, well, when they took uh, 3AW over, I <clears throat> went there and uh, I migrated really from Allen's to when the uh, radio business was starting to carve hell out of the music business yes. and during the Depression. Mm. Pound a year they charge you and you got yeah. music from six o'clock in the morning till unconscious <laughs> and uh, no charge, yeah. only the pound a year. Yeah. So they didn't buy any sheet music records or um, player roles. The year of your first real hit song is pretty close, isn't it? That was about 21, wasn't yeah, it? 21, <coughs> when uh, the first hit, hit song, of course, the really big smash was Gundagai, which, thank God, is still going strong. Mm. But I'll tell you a strange thing about this. Uh, when I wrote Gundagai, I had a, a, a very good singer he was an operatic singer, Eric Godley, his name was, an Englishman, and uh, he was appearing in big time. He was one of the headliners at the Tivoli. Tivoli used to have a... There was a snobbishness, by the way, in show business in those days. If you played for JCW, well, you were on the top bra brass. If you played at the Bijou, uh, you were going down grade. If you played at the Tivoli, you were up. Yes. Now, I'm afraid that uh, Mo and Jim Gerald and all good friends of mine, I don't think they'd have ever made the Tivoli at the time that uh, all these big acts were being imported out by Hugh D. McIntosh, mm. who was a brilliant showman, mm. staged the only world heavyweight championship that ever happened in Australia, Tommy Burns and Jack Johnson. Mm. 1908, wasn't it? You, you got a damn good memory of my life. <laughs> yes, I know it was 1908 yeah. because I was only a kid, I'd be 10 then. Mm -hmm. But I was mad no, uh, seeing this great fight, the two fighters, the uh, mm -hmm. best in the world. Anyhow, mm -hmm. much to all of our disgust at that time, uh, Tommy Burns was thrashed <laughs> by Jack Johnson. Yes, well, well, he, was. he was a hard man to beat. Mm -hmm. But Hugh McIntosh uh, was a remarkable man of theatre for various reasons, but he also has uh, a role in Gundagai, hasn't he? Be yes. Uh, I'd written a number called Down Caroline Way with Henry Penn, and uh, we took it up to UD at rehearsal morning, and uh, Mac... Uh, heard it and he said not a bad song and then he let go he had an invective that was uh, a bullocky would have been very proud of it he said why the bloody hell don't you get around and write a song about your own country instead of down caroline way and all these things don't forget at that time it was back home in tennessee or and if you didn't do that you just went in it mm. so yeah. anyhow uh, I went home and uh, the result was, uh, I, uh, on my own, one of my very first songs that I wrote without Henry Penn. Henry only was with me in those two numbers that I told about earlier. But uh, he, uh, I went home and I wrote Gundagai. And I can remember this, I was playing some of their, what we call their best ballads, to this Eric Godley who was... Uh, a big timer at the Tivoli and a fine operatic singer too. So I'd placed two or three numbers with him, which I was very pleased about. The type of friend of mine and that, you know, old encore ballads. And uh, he turned around and he says, what's this on the piano? And I said, oh, that's just a song I've written, Mr. Uh, Godley. And uh, I said, it wouldn't suit you, it's not your type. He said, run it over. So I ran it over and it wasn't his type. He said, I'll tell you something. He said, that song is going to make you famous. Those are exact words. Mm. And my godfather put me on the map properly. Then. Yes, yeah. There's a scene that lingers in my memory Of an old booth home and friends I long to see Why? 
trading back to an old fashioned check along the road to Gandaga, where the blue guns are growing and the marmitjis flowing beneath the sunny sky, where my daddy and mother. Childhood, once more I will see. Then no more will I roam when I'm heading my home along the road. When I get back there, I'll be a kid again. Oh, I'll never. Thought of free for pain. Once for I'll be playing where the guns are swinging along the road to Gandaga. There's a track winding back to an old pension check along the road to Gandaga. Marambitji's flowing beneath the sunny sky Where my daddy and mother are waiting for me And the piles of my childhood once more I will see Then no more will I roam when I'm heading right home You've told the story fairly often before, but it's worth retelling the, the way the song became the road to gun the guy, because that wasn't your first intention, was well, it? Well, you know that now, it was Bundaberg used to be, and matter of fact, I was looking when I reached the, 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 the tempo and everything, where the blue gums are growing, and I thought of Mississippi, if we had a word mm. like four, simple, four syllables, and uh, Mississippi, Mississippi, Murrumbidgee. It was there, and then I found out where Gundagai was. You ran your finger down the, the map and <laughs> Gundag it. lighted on Gundagai. Sure. Yeah. That's how it came to light. Yeah. But, uh, <clears throat> that, uh, and, and of course, the demand in Australia was enormous for it. Uh, it was a smash hit instantaneously, you know. Mm. We used to print 20,000 at a time, sheet music, that is. And, uh, but there were no records, so that... Uh, Finally, uh, they had to send to London, and uh, fortunately for me, Peter Dawson sang and recorded the first. Uh, but it wasn't on sale; it was in, on sale in Australia, but not uh, there were no recordings. The first recording they made in Australia was 1926. Um, 1926. Once they started to make records in Australia, that must have given your career a bit of a fillip, because here was a chance for. Australians to record their own songs. Uh, it was that, and then I got a, some a terrific break. The actual first recording made commercially by Columbia and Sydney, we were always called a Columbia in those days, it was of course HMV and Polydor and different one, Parlophone, and uh, the, uh, the first recording was uh, made by the Wentworth Orchestra, that's the uh, Wentworth Hotel Orchestra in Sydney, uh, I've forgotten the name of the conductor at the time, but one of my numbers was on it uh, after the dawn.
heard at least one of your songs sung as a ballad and then repeated by the Green Mill Orchestra uh, from Melbourne in, in dance tempo. And, and they could be two different songs. Josie and Me with that. Josie thing. and Me. <coughs> yes. That wasn't a bad recording. It's just a couple of sound notes from the band, but it was a good band. And uh, that was quite a hit. That was Josie and Me was written about my wife, of course. went on, you uh, started writing a lot of songs for special occasions. People would be in the news and out you would come with a, a song about them. I can think of several offhand. So well, can you, I'm sure. Well, I must say things like Kingsford Smith, you know, and the great flights of Amy Johnson and different people. The Don Bradman? Don, oh, of course. A little bit later, of course. Yeah, Don there, that was, that was one of my uh, great weaknesses because I was such an admirer of the man. that all Australia raves about Who has won our very highest praise Now is it Amy Johnson or little Mickey Mouse No, it's just a country lad who's bringing down the house And he's our Don Bradman Now I ask you, is he any good? Our Don Bradman as the batsman, he can sure lay on the wood. For when he goes into bat, he knocks every record flat. For there isn't anything he cannot do. Our Don Bradman, every Aussie dips his lid to you. Shut the gate when the boy from Barrel hits four after four. Our Don Bradman, what a welcome waits for you back home. 
A lot of composers have sort of favourite shows that didn't do as well as they thought they should have done, and oh. you have you have one, a musical that you wrote too, don't you? Well, I wrote in uh, that Flame of Desire was, uh, unfortunately, there was no recording in Melbourne at the time, none whatsoever. Mm. Sydney was coming back to it, and uh, the only recording of that you, you could get is uh, uh, the one that Humphrey Bishop made in, you've probably heard it, have you? I have heard it played, a little song mm. called Princess Marietta. No? Yeah, that's it, yeah. Yes. Oh, an MBE, by the way, um, from the government in 1970. I think I was one of the very first. I was in, I know in Who's Who, I was certainly the only one for many years in Who's Who, and for my dear wife, delightful person she was with the humour, the Herald used to ring every Saturday morning to find out uh, was I still alive? And, uh, <laughs> they do that because, you know, the night they used to have a little birthdays for today and so and so. Mm. And this day they rang my wife and she said, yes, he's not dead yet. <laughs> and, uh, <laughs> they didn't appreciate it very much. <laughs> and that was a few years ago. We shouldn't really go much further, Jack, without talking about uh, another show that's always associated with you, mainly through Gundagai, and that was the radio serial called Bad and Dave. Oh, God bless it. <laughs> <laughs> it was wonderful. I remember, I had a great opinion of George Edwards because he was a very, as you know, he played four or five parts in that show. But as Man a, with a thousand voices. Yes, yeah, sure. And on stage, he had a very good act. I've forgotten what his uh, first wife's name was. She died. She's a very nice person. And uh, I said to George when he was using Gundagai as the theme, I said, well, George, uh, I'm very grateful for you using Gundagai as a theme. He said, what other song could I use? Dad and Dave, brought to you at this time by Wrigley's. Makers of P.K., Spearmint, and Juicy Fruit Chewing Gum. What are you looking for in all your pockets, Daddy? A match? <laughs> no, son. Daddy's looking for a P.K. What do you want a P.K. for, Daddy? I want to wake up all the little taste buds on my tongue. What are taste buds, Daddy? Well, well, you see with your eyes, don't you? Yes. And you hear with your ears, don't you? Yes. Well, it's the taste buds on your tongue that help you to taste things. And nothing wakes them up faster than P.K. between smokes. And dear, I wish I could find some P.K. now. I've got a packet in my pocket, Daddy. Well, blow me down, Skipper. Why didn't you say so sooner? Come on, hand them over. Chew Wrigley's between smokes to increase your smoking pleasure. Refreshing Wrigley's chewing gum perks up all the taste buds in your tongue. They tingle with liveliness. And then when you do line up again, what a difference. That smoke will register 100%. You'll want to linger over it and come back for more. But before you have an encore, remember, chew some more Wrigley's. Do that and you'll always get full enjoyment out of your tobacco. And now, here come Dad and Dave. 
one thing about the, the serial Dad and Dave, it spawned off a couple more songs. Um, the dog sits on the well, tucker box? The dog sits on the tucker box. I uh, rang George and I uh, wrote it. I said, I've got another song for you, George. Uh, and he said, what is that? I said, well, the dog sits on the tucker box. He said, oh, I don't know, John. I said, well, it's written. I wrote it really for Mabel and Dave, the two characters in the show. But when George got the song, he immediately took it to himself and <laughs> put it in. And uh, there was a court case over it when I forgot that uh, Alf sang it. And uh, Alf, uh, Mabel's old man, sued him. <laughs> <laughs> and they ran it on for about six months. Yeah, this was in the story. I thought you, I thought you meant a, a real court case. Oh, no, oh, no. <laughs> but it was very good. I meet her every day and I know she's dinky doy Where the dog sits on the tucker box five miles from Gandhi I think she's bonza and she reckons that I'm good oh <laughs> She's such a trimmer that I've entered her for the local show And my maple waits for me underneath the bright blue sky where the dog sits on the tucker box five miles from Gandhi Goy. Better be starting me milking. I can hear Sally bellering out for me. Later on, I uh, turned out to win a boy from Alabama, which I had a note from both the Americans and the Australian government thanking me for cementing relations, which were a little bit, uh, you know. Boy from Alabama, you've got one particular version of that song that you like more than others, don't you? The well, yes, I, I preferred uh, J uh, Joy Nichols singing it. There were three or four recordings of it out here, <clears throat> but uh, I thought she sang it beautifully. Perchance in a quiet little street These two lonesome souls happen to me When a boy from Alabama Meets a girl from Gundagai Winter turns into spring And the birds start to sing A sweet lullaby the boy from Alabama tells the girl from Gundagai 
that believe it or not, he sure likes her a lot. A silver lining in the sky. Pretty soon they're strolling out together. A new day has begun. Life is just a bunch of sunny weather. And troubles like bubbles go one by one. When a boy from Alabama meets a girl from Gondagai. All the world is in tune, and a sweet honeymoon will happen in the by and by. When a boy from Alabama meets a girl from Gundagai, the storm clouds disappear, instead a rainbow's in the sky. When a boy from Alabama tells the girl, say you're a honey, then the dinkamazi girl, he doesn't care, he's got no money. He phones her in the morning and makes a special date. She hurries home from work that night. To see him, she can't wait. He looks like Robert Taylor. She loves his manly walk. She reckons she could sit for hours and listen to him talk. Pretty soon they're strolling out together. A new day has begun. Life is just a bunch of sunny weather. And troubles like bubbles go one by one. When a boy from Alabama meets a girl from Gundagai. All the world is in tune and a sweet honeymoon will happen in the by and by. One of the greatest breaks I ever got was uh, when I wrote Mexican Serenade. Ah, um, now we're going back to 32, aren't we? Yes. Now, my Godfather, you're right on the ball. <laughs> <laughs> I've done my homework. <laughs> you certainly have. Uh, I, I wrote that and uh, I was turning out a lot of numbers at that time and I thought, well, they're all pop light uh, things. This is a semi-classical written on the, the uh, Dalib uh, around the deep melody, you know, through the trees or a breeze. Dun, 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 dun. Yes, and, uh, but, uh, I, can, I don't know what I don't know what the deep melody is called uh, offhand, but well, yes. Uh, well, I got the, uh, the cable from America. Uh, Tauber has recorded, and Tauber was the biggest name in the business at the time. First song ever in English. Repeat. First song ever in English, and my God, I went out and had a couple of noggins on the thing for that. <laughs> <laughs> Actually, and his English was pretty good. It, it has a continental flavour, but he was perfectly understandable, wasn't he? Oh, quite. And I wrote that under the name of my eldest daughter. She was only about five or six at that time, <laughs> Pamela Therese. Uh, and uh, it was I, it was done well. I, I think. Uh, with the thought that there's too many O'Hagan songs coming through, uh, and I had a certain type of audience, but uh, that was, a, in my mind, a semi-classic, which it was, and uh, when Tauber recorded it, of course, in English, it was a, a smash. Mm -hmm. A real smash, and still goes along nicely, too. Just a dream, then 
whiskey, and our wonderful night was through. So our love dream has gone, memory still lingers on of the night and the Mexican terror. One of the best songs I think I ever wrote was Little Ships Will Sail Again, which was uh, recorded by, uh, you probably know it, uh, Turner Leighton of Leighton and Johnson, one of the top. Uh, I remember Keith Prowse, who published it, said, this has cost us a small fortune to get <laughs> Turner Leighton. You had to pay the big stars money then and uh, the singer to... Little ships will sail again Over a peaceful horizon Little ships will sail again Just as they roamed the seas before Little ships will sail again When the red sun is arising Cabin ships will sail again and bring their sailor men ashore. Then when the day is ending from out of the distant blue, sailing boats will come wending to the harbor where dreams come true. Soon the sun will shine and then out of the peaceful horizon Sailor men will sail again To home and happiness once more Little ships are sailing o'er the seven seas Sailing sometimes never to return Sailor men are sailing through adversities while their loved ones wait at home and yearn. But a silver lining soon will come and avenge. Peace will reign with us again. Little ships will sail again. Again. When the red sun is arising, gallant ships will sail again and bring their sailor men ashore. And when the day is ending from out of the distant blue. Sailing boats will come wending to the harbor where dreams come true. Soon the sun will shine and then out of the peaceful horizon, sailor men will sail again to home and the happy. I was think, talking to you earlier about the songs that you wrote in the late 20s and into the 30s, like Kingsford Smith, uh, Ozzy is Proud of You, and uh, A Lone Girl Flyer about Amy Johnson and our Don Bradman. Um, but come 1952, uh, you went back to writing songs about events that had happened and wrote one for um, Marjorie, Marjorie the Lithgow Flyer. Oh, yes. Oh, God, Father. <laughs> I'd forgotten that. <laughs> <coughs> Our Marjorie, the Lithgow Flyer. <laughs> She'd won the games in uh, Finland, was it? Or? Oh. <coughs> I remember the line in the song, though, goes, uh, she's the fastest sprinter in the Olympic Games. <laughs> In the 
Bobby Todd of Lithgow in the state of New South Wales, a shy and modest, unassuming girl, has put the town of Lithgow on the map and never fails to set the heart of our kids in a world. She's Marjorie. A little flyer, a Marjorie, is she a trier? The fastest thing in running at the Olympic Games. The brilliant queens have won her all the world's acclaim. Our Marjorie, as modest as they make them, a Marjorie, but records can't be breaking. The Lipko passes through the smash a champion through and through. And Marjorie, we're telling you. Every day come out is proud of you. Another thing that you were mixed up in, uh, and we really have skipped over all those years that you were in broadcasting, uh, you were almost the originator in this country of what might be called singing commercials. In fact, you wrote one about gin. I wrote a lot of singing commercials, and I'm sorry that I, I never kept a lot of the copies. Some of them were damn good numbers. Uh, Lipton Tea one. Lipton Tea is the world's great selling tea. And... Uh, um, uh, don't say gin, say gilbies, you know. Yes. Uh, and there were several of those that were good songs, would have clicked anyhow. Yeah. And uh, did a hell of a good job for their sponsors. Did the sponsors come to you and ask you for a song, or did you get the idea? Uh, no, we were... Uh, I'd, and this was about 1952-53. I'd gone across to O'Brien Publicity then, and they had the agency for Lipton Tea, and they had the agency for... Uh, also Gilby's, and uh, I said I think a number of them might go well there, and wrote the numbers and they are both accepted. When the world seems upside down and you're feeling low, you can easily lose that frown and set your heart aglow. All you really need to do is have a little drink or two of Gilby's gin, it's good for you. But don't say gin, say Gilby's. It will brighten up the day, drive your troubles all away, put you in a mood so gay. But don't say gin, say Gilby's. Gin is really good for you, sip it at your leisure, serve it just to suit the taste. It's bound to meet with pleasure. In a cocktail, it's just fine. A gin and tonic, that's divine. Whichever way you take it, it's on the line. But don't say gin, say Gilby's. 
you wrote a song that's said to be the last song that you wrote back in 67 uh, called God Bless Australia. Yes, I, I must confess, I wrote it in 1963 really yeah. to the melody of the of the Walsing Matilda. Oh, I see. I didn't realise it was Did you? Oh, yes, no. it is. God bless Australia, our land Australia, home of the Anzac, the strong and the free. It's a old oh, house to go for town. <laughs> it's a homeland, a chumla, to cherish for eternity. God bless Australia, the land of the free. It. Uh, it was, I think, had everything to be the, uh, what I hoped it would be, the national anthem. And then Whitlam uh, decided, he, he was very keen about it, but he thought, oh, we'd better have a competition on the damn thing. And I got 25,000 entries, and there's not one that was worth a cracker. They never <laughs> are. land of ours, Australia, proud possession, our own piece of earth that was built by our fathers who pioneered our heritage. God bless Australia, the land of our birth. God bless Australia, God bless Australia, home of the ants and the strong and the free. It's our home and our own land to cherish for eternity. God bless Australia, the land of the free. Here in Australia, we treasure love and liberty. Our way of life, all for one, one for all. We're a peace-loving race, but should danger ever threaten us? Let the world know we will answer the call. God bless Australia, God bless Australia. Home of the Anzac, the strong and the free. It's our home and our own land to cherish for eternity. God bless Australia, the land of the free. God bless Australia, God bless Australia. Home of the Anzac, the strong and the free. It's our home and our own land to cherish for eternity. God bless Australia, the land. fortunate enough for that uh, period roughly from about 1920 to 1952 till, till, till the rock period hit us. After that I faded out because I, <laughs> as uh, Hoagie Carmichael wrote in one letter, he said, we're not in the race for this. He said, well, it's no use of us trying to write it. He said, because they'd know in a minute that we didn't belong to it. <laughs> Once more I will see, then no more will 
I roam when I'm heading right for home along the road to Gundagai. Hello, old timer. How's things? They're pretty crook. Things must be pretty crook round these parts, mate. What was no rain for your stock and them all dying, you must be having a pretty crook truck. But you ain't got it all on your own. Blimey, no. The other day I asked a bloke if he had any old clothes he didn't want. Spruce, he took a look at me and said, ain't them you got on old enough? Yes, things is pretty crook, all right. I knocked on a bloke's door the other day, and when the missus comes out, I gets down on me hands and knees and started eating the grass. I said, missus, I'm not hungry, I'll eat grass. She said, you poor man, go round the back, it's much longer. Yes, things is crook, all right. Well, suppose I'd better be jogging along. All right, mate, all right, I'll see you again. <laughs> That interview was originally broadcast last year. Thanks to Rob Sharp, who was the producer, and to Peter Burgess of the Australian National Library. Jack O'Hagan, you know, was one of the most prolific recording artists in Australia in the 1920s. Let's finish with a song he recorded with Art Chapman's orchestra in 1929. Not his own composition this time, but a Rudy Valley number. I'm just a vagabond lover In search of a sweetheart it seems And I know that someday I'll discover The girl of my vagabond dreams Rob Sharp and I went down to Melbourne about three years ago to make that program with Jack O'Hagan. He was as bright as a button as you could hear in the interview. We got there about 10 in the morning, I remember, and then uh, we recorded until about 12, and then Jack decided it was uh, time for his daily scotch. So that came out of the cabinet, and uh, a nurse was summoned, and uh, she had to bring some ice, and we had a little sort of pre-lunch in a pair of teeth together. Well... Jack O'Hagan, dead the other day at 88, Bailey to him. And that brings Sentimental Journey to a close for another week. I hope you'll be able to join us, though, next week at the usual time. From our writer-producer, Alison White, and me, John West, good night to you. ABC Radio, it's 10 o'clock.